the Hague Odyssey addresses um, the challenges faced by Israel on the front lines of terrorism and her battle for justice at the United Nations. In this book, The Hague Odyssey, I've taken the liberty of examining issues and controversies that surround Israel's construction of the terrorism prevention security fence, which became the centerpiece of action at the United Nations and at the International Court of Justice, confronting and in some respects condemning Israel's rights and obligations as a responsible nation state of the world. The legal and factual analysis contained within the Hague Odyssey is designed to be comprehensive. The footnotes are voluminous. The references on all sides of the issue, those who agree, those who disagree, are there so that people can make an informed, intelligent decision about right and wrong. The legal and factual analysis also is designed to address the goal of uh, permitting not just the reader, but permitting the public policy, public policy makers, the lawyers in the international sphere, to assess the International Court of Justice's advisory opinion in the context of the widespread implications of the court's decision, both from a public policy perspective and in international law. You see, the International Court of Justice is an organ, an arm, if you will, of the United Nations itself. One would think that the United Nations, which is built upon the principle of equality for man, equality for nations, equality for diverse minds, equality and justice for all, one would think that at the United Nations, every country in the world would be treated with respect. Every country in the world would be treated with the dignity that it deserves when that country acts properly. There is, however, an exception at the United Nations, and that exception notably and unfortunately and sadly is the state of Israel. There is history. Let's not go back thousands of years. Let's not even go back to the British uh, mandatory period, uh, to the League of Nations, uh, to the Balfour Declaration. Let's go simply to contemporary time period. In 1947, the United Nations adopted a resolution uh, partitioning or dividing lands governed by the British mandatory power with a plan of establishing two states, one Jewish, one Arab, and with special status for Jerusalem. In May 1948, the Jewish state of Israel came into being through her Declaration of Independence and was both recognized by various governments around the world and accepted as a member state of the United Nations. A number of countries, chiefly the Arab countries, not only did not recognize Israel as a nation state, but chose instead to attack. And uh, the sad story is not about the wars, the sad story is about the lives of people who were affected by those wars and the skirmishes and the attacks continuing until this day. What was anticipated by the United Nations is that there would not only be, as I've already said, a Jewish state which came into existence as the state of Israel, but that there would also be established the independent state of Arab Palestine, which to this day still has not yet come into reality as a sovereign state. The announcement of Secretary Kerry just yesterday here in Washington that the Israelis and Palestinians will return to direct negotiations with the aid of the United States made clear that there are various goals to be accomplished. One, the establishment of a sovereign state for the Palestinian people. Two, guarantees for Israel that her safety and security will be secure. Other very important core issues need to be addressed and are on the table for discussion and for resolution. But let's look back briefly over the past 65 years since Israel's declaration of her independence. Israel has faced and continues to face momentous challenges, including wars, skirmishes, rocket launchings, terrorist, murderous suicide bombings, assaults on her citizens, 
challenges to her legal status, boycotts, threats, accusations, and demonization. Fast forward for a moment through multiple wars. Fast forward through a for a moment to lack of progress. Fast forward to through even a peace agreement with Egypt in 1979. Fast forward to the summer of 2000, if you will, just barely 13 years ago. Chairman Yasser Arafat of the Palestine Liberation Organization met at Camp David with President Clinton and Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. The Prime Minister offered to the Palestinians an agreement that included the establishment of the Palestinian sovereign nation. And it was based upon territorial borders that essentially constituted approximately 96% of the land located west of the Jordan River, known as the West Bank, and including the Gaza Strip on the Mediterranean. Much to the chagrin of both uh, President Clinton and the disappointment of uh, Prime Minister Barack, Chairman Arafat did not accept the proposal, and he left the President and the Prime Minister essentially standing alone at Camp David. Shortly thereafter, in late September 2000, now 13 years ago, the Palestinian uprising known as the Second Intifada commenced, bringing with it murderous suicide bombings and other attacks inside Israel, targeting buses, shopping centers, hotels, restaurants, university cafeterias, and attacking people in their homes and in the streets. In response, in order to protect her people, the Israeli government commenced construction of a very controversial but much needed terrorism prevention security fence, parts of which include concrete barriers akin to what we in the United States uh, often call Jersey walls on expressways. Although portions admittedly are quite high and obtrusive in order to provide safety to vehicles and persons below. This terrorism prevention security fence is called by some a wall and was the central core issue of a request of the United Nations for the International Court of Justice to issue an advisory opinion as to the legal issues surrounding the barrier. Admittedly, the barrier snakes through lands that include olive groves, farming fields, and runs adjacent to villages, towns, and even cities on both sides of the barrier the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. Some have accused Israel of establishing a de facto border between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And that issue, that issue will be discussed in the coming days, weeks, and months under the tutelage of Secretary Kerry. Others have accused Israel of establishing an apartheid wall, a wall that they claim to be like segregation in apartheid South Africa, dividing black and white, being illegal, being racial, being criminal. We all know the story of South Africa. And the next time you hear in the press or read in the press a reference to Israel's apartheid wall, I hope that you will stand up and say, not so, not true not just, because there is no comparison to the segregation in South Africa and to the challenges faced by the State of Israel as it addresses achieving an agreement with the Palestinians. These negotiations that have just restarted, we all know, have been dormant now for four and a half years. Nothing has happened. It's not a matter of blame. It's not a matter of finger pointing. The fact of the matter is everyone is to blame. And the fact of the matter is the call by Prime Minister Netanyahu for negotiations without preconditions has been repeatedly met by condition after condition after condition. We all hope there will be progress in these coming months, but there is no assurance we will see that progress. And we must consider not only what are the options, we must consider the ramifications of what I like to refer to as the politics of fear. Because you see, when you accuse Israel of having built an apartheid wall,
You accuse Israel of being a racist state. You accuse Israel of being a criminal state. And when you have an apartheid, racist, criminal state, you can then take that state to the International Criminal Court, another court situated in The Hague. When you go to the International Criminal Court, you can accuse not just a country. You can accuse its leaders. You can accuse its military. You can accuse its diplomats of having committed criminal offenses. And don't think that that hasn't already not just been threatened, but that hasn't already begun. Because as you'll hear in a moment regarding the International Court of Justice advisory opinion on the fence, one of the things that came out of that decision is not what I have now repeatedly referred to it as an advisory opinion, but it has begun to take the force of law. People Countries have mistakenly said, here is precedent, and the law is based upon statutes and ordinances, but it's also based upon the common law, it's based upon uh, decisions, precedent. So taking an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, which refers to Israel as having been in violation and being in violation of international law today has set up the parameter for countries to accuse people of being in violation of not only international law, but international criminal law. That came as a result of the late 2003 effort by the Palestinians and their support supporters at the United Nations to seek a resolution at the UN General Assembly defying the UN Charter which vests the right of peace and security issues in the UN Security Council. Let me repeat, the UN Security Council has the sole responsibility for peace and security in the world under the United Nations banner. The General Assembly, which is one country, one vote, decides on all kinds of issues but cannot control or mandate those issues unless they go through the Security Council, which has members sitting on it from all over the world, permanent members and others. Only one country in the world is not eligible to sit on the Security Council of the United Nations, and that country is Israel. And the technical reasons are because she's not in the regional grouping in which she belongs, and she's not eligible to sit, and therefore she can't sit. So while the United Nations is based indeed upon the rule of one country, one vote, at the Security Council, every country in the world can have a vote when it becomes their turn, except Israel, which gets no vote because it gets no turn. Take a look at, for a moment at what was the referral resolution of the International uh, of the United Nations General Assembly to the International Court of Justice. What question was asked to be decided? I quote, what are the legal consequences arising from the construction of the wall being built by Israel, the occupying power in the occupied Palestinian territory, including in and around East Jerusalem, as described in the report of the Secretary General considering the rules and principles of international law, including the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949 and relevant Security Council and General Assembly resolutions. The question itself presumes a wall, yet only approximately 5% of the entire fence line is a concrete barrier. But it presumes a wall, and it evokes the image of the apartheid wall. The question presumes that Israel is an occupying power, evoking concepts in international law of improper conduct. That is the presumption. And the question of the UN General Assembly to the International Court of Justice presumes that this is all about occupied Palestinian territory. What's missing? What's missing is any reference to Israel's right and obligation to defend her people. What's missing is any reference to the people who suffered loss of lives and limbs at the hands of the terrorists. In the decision of the court itself, what's missing is an acknowledgement of Israel's right and obligation to defend her people, except in one small reference. And what's missing is any acknowledgement of the heinous, murderous attacks by the terrorists 
on the Israeli people that required the establishment of the wall. At the United Nations, you know, we have come over time to know we can't expect a lot, but we always hope for more. We hope for fair standing, we hope for fair treatment, but we have come to learn Israel doesn't get fair standing and fair treatment. The International Court of Justice, sitting in The Hague in 2004, convened at the Peace Palace for deliberations on the issue of the advisory opinion. Israel, the United States, Canada, and other nations strongly challenged the jurisdiction or the right of the court to accept review of the issues and issuance of the advisory opinion. However, the court, which is comprised of nine judges or justices, each from a different country, determined that it would review the legal issues involved in Israel's building of the wall, and then went forward to issue, without any regard to the decisions of Israel's high court, without any regard to the petitions by human rights organizations that were being reviewed in Israel, without giving any deference to Israel's rights as a sovereign nation state, the International Court of Justice issued this blistering advisory opinion. The main dissent was the United States Justice Thomas Bergenthal. And he took to task the process, the procedures, the court, the justices, the decision, the rationale, the reason, and the inflammatory danger of the court's decision. Why danger? Because any country in the world has the right to stand up for her people. Every country in the world has the right to stand up for her people. This decision of the International Court of Justice pretends to take that away only from Israel, but in fact, its precedential value will apply to every democratic peace-loving nation desiring to protect her people. When we filed the brief on behalf of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, our argument was precise. It focused on Israel's right and obligation to, defense, to defend her people. It focused on the barrier or fence being not a barrier, but a, not a border, but an attempt to protect her civilian population. On the days when the International Court of Justice convened, we went to The Hague. It was indeed an odyssey. Organizations bought, brought a burned out bus from Israel to The Hague and parked it inside the Peace Palace. We participated in a rally for human rights. And on behalf of the victims of terrorism, we marched to the old city hall in The Hague, where in the presence of members of the European Parliament, victims of terrorism testified clearly enunciating their pain over the loss of loved ones. I remember like yesterday, one father taking from his pocket a bullet and holding the bullet in his fingers. It was the bullet that went through the eye of his son, shot by a terrorist and shot for solely the purpose of advocating their political goals as freedom fighters, they pretend, but through terrorism. What country in the world would permit terrorists in this city, in any city? What country in the world wouldn't do whatever it could to defend her people? What country wouldn't build a terrorism prevention security fence? Let's just look for a moment at fences. You know, the um, Great Wall of China is not just a wonder of the world. It was built for security purposes. The U.S.-Mexican border has a fence on it. It is for security purposes and to keep people out that the United States determines aren't eligible to be here. Israel has built the terrorism prevention security fence to keep people out who not only have no right to be inside, but who come with intent to harm come with intent to maim, come with intent to kill. The ink on the advisory opinion was barely dry. When the Palestine Liberation Organization, as the recognized sole representative of the Palestinian people, were calling for war crimes accusations to be leveled against Israel relating to the fence, and you heard about that subject 
yesterday in the press. Part of the deal that is on the table is that the Palestine Liberation Organization as the negotiating arm of the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people will refrain from going to the International Criminal Court. And what is their basis? You've already heard it. They will cite the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. They will cite war crimes. They will cite human rights violations. And they will attempt to bring, believe it, believe it, believe it. And if it's not done in their name, it will be done in the names of others. I know people who have had to leave countries based upon warrants that have been served for violating human rights rights in Israel, where the violation extends to the building of the fence. One country in Europe actually initiated a massive criminal investigation against a company that provided equipment to help build the fence. There will be no stop. There will be no end. We, however, together must stand up and seek justice. Because if we don't stand up against the terrorism, if we don't stand up against the terrorists, if we don't stand up against those who sponsor, fund, and enable the terrorists, then we are the ones who are at fault. Because not just the politics of fear continue, but upon us is the threat of a third intifada. Think of that threat. Thousands of people, again being faced with bombings, attacks, not just from Gaza, not just from Lebanon, not just from Hezbollah, not just from Syria, not just from Iran, but from inside Israel, from terrorists who are positioned because the threat has been enunciated just in these days. And that threat is an approach that says not just negotiate in good faith, but reach an agreement we want or else. And the or else, my friends, deals with the rights of people, the rights of you, your families, of us and families and friends and people we don't know all over the world who may walk on the streets, who may go in shopping centers, who may ride in a bus, anywhere, their right to be free, their right to be safe. I conclude the Hey Odyssey as I conclude tonight. There is little question that the security fence will continue to play an important role in Israel's self-defense and its battle for security on the front lines of terrorism. There is also no doubt that Israel's ongoing battle for justice at the United Nations will continue. And I quote, the state of Israel as every sovereign country and the family of nations has the right and obligation to protect and defend her people. No ruling, resolution, or advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice should interfere with any nation's duty to defend her citizens, nor any citizen's right and entitlement to be defended by his or her country. To permit otherwise would not only be a travesty of justice, but would itself lead democratic nations and freedom-loving people into an odyssey of the unknown. And in that context, Israel, the only country without the right to vote on the Security Council, Israel, the only country that is the subject of more resolutions and committees and focused attention at the United Nations than all other countries put together in the world, Israel, the only country that is America's mainstay ally in the Middle East, Israel, the only country that is the democratic ally of the United States in the Middle East. Israel, the country where, where the United States can land airplanes, can land people, can take away not just brain power, but technology and contributions to humanity, to the arts, to science, to culture, to values, to principles, to independence, to freedom, and to respect and dignity and love of life. Israel, 
that country does not deserve second-class citizenship at the United Nations. Israel, that country does not deserve second-class citizenship or second-class reference in any media organization, in any interview, or in any decision of any court of justice, and certainly not in the International Court of Justice. That itself was and remains a travesty of justice, and it will change only when we stand together on behalf of the State of Israel and others who preserve and protect the dignity of man and the dignity of all people. When we stand together, we will see a better day for all people. Thank you very much.